The rear foot, or ankle joint complex, is unique in that it is the interface between the upper segment and the lower segment of the lower extremity. The ankle joint complex has the primary responsibility of managing the body's weight with and against the ground reaction forces below. Successful negotiation of these forces is critical to accomplish multiplane motion and bipedal ambulation. This biomechanical complex consists of the bones of the hind foot, talus, and calcaneus, and two anatomical distinct joints, the ankle, or tibiotalar joint, and the subtalar joint. For this illustration, we will begin by describing the ankle joint. This joint exists between the smoothed, spindle-shaped trochlear surface of the talus and the ankle mortise formed by two malleoli and the plafond of the tibia. The neutral orientation of the ankle joint axis is that of a pronatory and supinatory joint, which runs lateral, posterior, and plantar to medial, anterior, and dorsal. This arrangement corresponds to the deviation of the malleoli in the ankle mortis. The spatial orientation of this joint's axis in relation to the three cardinal body planes is 8 degrees from the transverse plane, 82 degrees from the sagittal plane, and 20 to 30 degrees from the frontal plane. With this configuration, we can consider the planal dominance of the ankle joint. Since the ankle joint has the largest deviation from the sagittal plane, we can conclude that the dominant motions in the ankle joint thus are plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. An exception to this concept is frontal plane motion. Because of the ankle mortise and soft tissue that surrounds the joint, we clinically see less frontal plane movement than would be inferred from the deviation of the axis from the frontal plane. Thus, the resulting motion of the frontal plane is clinically insignificant because of this soft tissue and osseous block. The joint axis changes dynamically between plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. At neutral and dorsiflex positions, the joint axis runs from lateral, posterior, and plantar to medial, anterior, and dorsal. However, with plantar flexion, the axis shifts or tilts ever so slightly in the frontal plane, therefore running lateral, posterior, and dorsal to medial, anterior, and plantar. This is because of the spindle-shaped trochlear surface of the talus is maintaining contact with the plafond of the tibia and therefore resulting in a slight seesawing motion of that joint axis in the frontal plane. In gait, the ankle joint functions in two modes, open chain and closed chain. Open chain is when the foot is off the ground with the distal segment free, and closed chain, the foot is in contact with the ground where the distal segment is not free. Open chain motion in the ankle joint occurs at the distal portion of that joint, where the calcaneus and foot will be in motion relative to the fixed position of the talus and leg. Open chain pronation in the ankle joint results with the foot in dorsiflexion, abduction, and with some clinical insignificant eversion. Open chain supination results in plantar flexion, adduction, and some clinical insignificant inversion. Remember these motions are produced by movement of the calcaneus and foot on a fixed talus and leg. Closed chain motion is more complicated because rotation of the foot is blocked by the ground, and thus all movement is produced by the moving leg relative to a fixed foot. In closed chain dorsiflexion, the leg is brought toward the fixed foot, and the abduction that occurred in the open chain is now seen as internal rotation of the leg. During closed chain plantar flexion, the leg is moving to a position away from the fixed foot, and adduction that occurred in open chain now exists as external rotation of the leg. It is always important to remember that closed chain motion is a function of the lower extremity, where a motion occurs in and around a relatively fixed foot position. This portion of the illustration of the ankle joint complex will focus on the subtalar joint, which lies inferiorly to the tibiotalar joint. It exists between the anterior, middle, and posterior facets on the plantar surface of the talus, and the anterior, middle, and posterior facets of the dorsal surface of the calcaneus. The orientation of the subtalar axis is that of a pronatory and supinatory joint, which run lateral, posterior, and plantar, to medial, anterior, and dorsal, which can be demonstrated to bisect the posterior facet of the calcaneus. The degrees of orientation of the joint axis relative to the three cardinal body planes are 48 degrees from the transverse plane, 42 degrees from the frontal plane, and 16 degrees from the sagittal plane. The planal dominance in the subtalar joint is different from the ankle joint. Since we see a relatively equal deviation of the joint axis from the frontal and transverse planes, we clinically see a co-dominance in the mobility in both of these planes.
This relationship exists as a nearly one-to-one -one ratio. Thus, it can be clinically inferred that for every degree of motion produced in the frontal plane will result in the production of an equal degree of motion in the horizontal plane. This relationship has been compared to a mitered hinge, which is a hinge at 45 degrees that acts as a torque converter and takes rotational forces of the frontal or vertical segment and produces equal rotation of the horizontal segment. Clinically, because of this one-to-one -one ratio, we can consider the frontal and horizontal axis and motion one in the same. Open chain movement at the subtalar joint is produced by motion of the calcaneus, which lies distal to the talus. This results in the calcaneus and remainder of the foot to move about the fixed talus and leg. Open chain pronation at the subtalar joint is a result of the foot being dorsiflexed, abducted, and everted, whereas open chain supination is a result of the foot being plantar flexed, adducted, and inverted. Remember these motions are produced by the movement of the calcaneus and remaining foot while the talus and leg fixed. Closed chain motion is more complicated because a majority calcaneal motion is inhibited by ground and all movement which is blocked by the ground is produced by equal and opposite motion at the proximal talus and leg in relation to the foot. It is important to know that not all motion is blocked by the ground at the calcaneus. While sagittal and transverse motions become limited in a closed chain environment, calcaneal motion in the frontal plane remains the same. Thus, in closed chain pronation, the calcaneus will still evert, but abduction and dorsiflexion are performed by tailor plantar flexion and adduction with internal rotation of the leg. This process of closed chain pronation produces a morphological lower and wider foot because the talus is lowered from the calcaneus while protruding out medially. Likewise, in closed chain supination, the calcaneus will still invert, but adduction and plantar flexion are performed by tailored dorsiflexion and abduction with external rotation of the leg. This process of closed chain supination produces a morphologically taller and thinner foot because the talus becomes stacked over the calcaneus and rotated into a narrower configuration. This completes our illustration of the ankle joint complex. The two components of the ankle joint complex are the tibio tibiotalar joint, which has planal dominance in the sagittal plane, and the subtalar joint, which has planal dominance in the transverse and frontal planes. The ankle joint complex is highly specialized, thereby resulting in efficient translation and dissipation of the external forces being produced by the ground and the weight of the body during the gait cycle.